Hello everybody and welcome back to another lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be covering the Rayleigh-Ritz method which is an approximation method used to solve systems based on minimizing the potential energy of the system. So the question is why do we need the Rayleigh-Ritz method? Well if we look at problems in civil engineering or mechanical engineering if we want an exact solution, oftentimes we need to solve a differential equation. For instance, if I had an axially loaded bar or a truss, I would have to solve the differential equation on the left. If I had a beam under flexure, I would have to solve the differential equation on the right. Either way, I have to solve a differential equation to obtain my exact solution, and that kind of sucks. So the Rayleigh-Ritz method comes in and provides a way of approximating these exact solutions without the requirement of actually needing to solve these differential equations. Now, as we're going to see, there's a lot of different approximation methods and they basically do different things. The Rayleigh-Ritz method is based upon minimizing the potential energy of the system. So you guys may be asking, Clayton, what exactly is this potential energy of the system? Well, it's actually a very nice, simple formula where the potential energy of the system is simply the total strain energy of the system minus the work done on the system. So the first term here, we call it the total strain energy or the internal strain energy. And the second term is the work done on the system by external forces. Now, even though it looks really simple, we probably have a lot of questions. The first is, why are we minimizing this potential energy? Again, the whole goal of the Rayleigh-Ritz method is to minimize potential energy, but we didn't say why. Another question you guys may be asking is, okay, well, how do we calculate this internal strain energy and the work done. In our formula above, it's very general. It doesn't provide us much insight on what exactly we are doing. And then finally, all right, I calculated that potential energy, but how do I minimize the potential energy and solve for my approximate solution? Well, to answer the first question, let's look at potential energy and equilibria or equilibrium. So the potential energy of a system is actually related to the stability of the system. So you guys may have seen this in many textbooks. It's very, very common. But let's say I had a ball and I placed the ball inside of a tube. Now let's say I take the ball and I move it a little bit to the left and I release it. Well, of course, this ball is going to return to its original position. Now what we say is if this is the case, our potential energy of the system is actually minimum. And this means that we have a stable equilibrium. Now our second case is instead of a tube, let's say that we had a flat surface with our ball. And again, I'm just going to take our ball and I'm going to move it a little bit to the left. Now, if I were to release it, nothing happens. The ball won't move. It stays in a new equilibrium form. And in this case, we say that the potential energy of the system is actually constant. It's the exact same. And we call this neutral equilibrium. Now for our final case, we're going to take the ball and we're going to put it on the outside of a tube. Now, if I were to take my ball, move it a little bit to the left, well, we know that the ball is simply going to roll off. In this particular case, our potential energy is maximum, and this leads to what we say is an unstable equilibrium. Now, we say that the goal of the Rayleigh-Ritz method is to find an approximate solution that satisfies the condition of stable equilibrium, or in other words, that that potential energy is a minimum. And of course, this makes sense to us. If we're designing a structure, and we were to, let's say, move the structure a little bit, we don't want it to become unstable and buckle or anything like that. We want a nice stable solution because that typically guarantees safety. So this is why we want to minimize that potential energy because it guarantees us a stable equilibrium. So let's go on to the second question. What are the terms in that potential energy formula? Well, we're going to start off with the most general case, and that is continuums. So in general, the strain energy density, which I'm going to call U bar of a material, can be computed as the area under the stress strain curve of a material. So let's say that I take a material, steel for instance, I take it to the lab and I pull it under uniaxial tension and I get the following curve. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, are you on drugs or something? That's not how steel behaves. That looks more like concrete. Well, this is just for the purpose of illustration, so don't take this uh, <laughs> too seriously. Now, what we said is the strain energy density is going to be the area under that curve. So all I need to do to get this strain energy density in the most general sense is integrate our stress function over the strains. All right. Doesn't sound too bad, but it actually is nice and easy because in this particular course, we are dealing with linear elastic materials. Therefore, they have a nice stress strain relationship and the strain energy density being the area under the curve. Well, that's simply just a triangle. 
Therefore, our u-bar can be calculated as 1 half of sigma ij multiplied by epsilon ij. Now, another thing we have to consider is that when we're dealing with continuums, they have six stress components. They have sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we have to consider each one of those components in our strain energy density. So therefore, our u bar is simply going to be 1 half a sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 times epsilon 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 times epsilon 3, 3, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, we're just taking the area under the curve of all six of those stress components. Now, this is the strain energy density, but this isn't exactly what we're after. Remember in the formula for that strain energy, we integrate that strain energy density. What this does is this gives us the total strain energy of the system. How do we do that again? Well, we simply integrate our strain energy density over the initial domain. So if I'm looking to calculate that total strain energy term, all I simply do is I take my strain energy density, which we defined above, and we integrate it over the initial domain. Now you guys might be asking, why are we integrating over the initial domain rather than the deformed domain? Well, it's simple. We don't know the deformed domain at that point. That's why we're trying to determine an approximate solution. So you're saying, all right, well, if we're integrating over the initial domain, is that, is that valid? Well, it is valid because we are assuming small deformations. Therefore, the volume before and after deformation, we're assuming it's not going to change very much. So our error will actually be very, very little. Now that was for continuums, but as you guys may have seen in this course, we mainly deal with Euler-Bernoulli beams, at least so far. <laughs> so what we'd like to do is determine a nice equation for the internal strain energy of an Euler-Bernoulli beam, and we can actually derive this total strain energy for a beam as a specific case of a continuum. So remember for a continuum, we had the following formula, where it's simply the summation of sigma ij multiplied by epsilon ij divided by 2, and then we integrate that over our domain. Now, if you guys recall back to our theory on Euler-Bernoulli beams, recall that we only had one non-zero strain component, and that was epsilon 1, 1. Therefore, the following equation is actually simplified because we don't need a summation. We only have one term. So it simplifies into the integral over the domain of sigma 1, 1 multiplied by epsilon 1, 1 divided by 2. Now we can actually simplify this even further because remember for Euler-Bernoulli beams, we don't consider Poisson effects. Therefore, sigma 1, 1 is actually equal to the Young's modulus E multiplied by epsilon 1, 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to take this formula, multiply the epsilon 1, 1 in, and we get the integral over the domain of our elastic modulus E multiplied by epsilon 1, 1 squared, and then divided by 2. So it's already looking very, very nice. Now we can do one more simplification, and that is from the theory of Euler-Bernoulli beams, we actually know what epsilon 1, 1 is. It's equal to negative x2 multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute that into our internal strain energy formula, and I'm good to go. So the last thing that we really need to do is integrate over that domain. Well, for a beam, that's pretty simple because we know that we're going to integrate from 0 to L in the x1 direction negative h over 2 to h over 2 in the x2 direction, and then from 0 to b in the x3 direction. And this leads us to the following formula. Now, if we look at this formula, inside there we have a base times height cubed. And if you guys are engineers, I know that you guys are thinking, oh, wait a second, base times height cubed? I know that that is related to the moment of inertia. And that's correct. So we know our moment of inertia for a square cross-section is base times height cubed divided by 12. So we can substitute that into our formula to obtain our final total strain energy equation for an Euler-Bernoulli beam, which is simply the integral over the length of the beam of EI divided by 2 multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function squared. So this is actually a pretty nice easy formula. EI, well that's just the properties of the beam, you guys are typically given that. The only thing that we don't really know at this point is our deflection function, but again that's what we're trying to solve for using the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Now a little tip or trick if you guys will. Please don't forget the squared sign. That is the most common mistake when dealing with this problem for students is they forget the squared sign on that second derivative. So after we attain the second derivative of our displacement function, we actually have to square it. All right, so that's the internal strain energy. But we said that if we're calculating potential energy, we actually have two components. First is the internal strain energy. We calculate that before we're good to go. But the second one was the work done by external forces. Now, this sounds really crazy, really complex. However, it's actually really simple. 
The work done on a system is simply the external force on the system multiplied by its respective displacement. So if we have continuums, we typically have two external forces acting on the system. The first one is traction vectors, and these act over surfaces. As you guys remember from the Cauchy stress tensor, we can calculate these traction vectors no problem. Now the second one is body forces, so this would be something like gravity, and these act over the volume. Therefore, if I want to calculate my external work done on the system, it's simply going to be the dot product of our traction vector with our displacement vector, and then integrate it over the surfaces, because remember these traction vectors act over surfaces. And then we add that to the dot product of our body forces vector with our displacement vector integrated over the actual volume. So that's the more complex case continuums. But if we were to consider Euler Bernoulli beams, it's actually a little bit more simple. So the first force that we have on Euler Bernoulli beams, perhaps the most trivial, is we have those distributed loads Q that act over the length of the beam. Now we also have cases where we have concentrated point loads, which I call P and they act at specific points, and then we can also have concentrated moments m also acting at specific points. So from here we can calculate the work done on the system as simply the integral from 0 to L of q, our distributed load, multiplied by our deflection function y, plus the summation of any point loads p, multiplied by the deflection at those point loads. So I want to make this really clear because this is again one thing students forget, is if we look at the deflection term with our point load, it's not just y, it's y subscript i. And what this means is we multiply by the deflection specifically at that point load. We don't multiply it by the general deflection function. We multiply it by the deflection function when x1 is equal to the location of our point load. And then finally, we have the summation of our concentrated moments m multiplied by their respective rotations. So that's another thing to keep in mind is when we're dealing with concentrated moments, we don't multiply them by deflections we actually multiply them by rotations. And that's it, nice and easy. So if I were to consider the potential energy of the system, all we need to do is take our total strain energy term and our work done on the system term. So if I were to look at the potential energy of the system, well, it's actually nice and easy now because I have my total strain energy term and I have my work done by external forces term. Therefore, we can develop a nice expression for the potential energy of the system. So if we start at continuums, Again, all we're doing is we're taking that total strain energy and we're subtracting the work done on the system and we get the following equation. If we were to look at Euler Bernoulli beams, we're doing the same thing, taking our total strain energy and simply subtracting our work done on the system. Now, this is actually very special because if we look up at that first equation for continuums, our only real unknown is going to be that displacement vector u. Typically, in these scenarios, we're given our stress tensor, and from our stress tensor, we can calculate those traction vectors and we can calculate the strains. Now, if we were to look at Euler Bernoulli beams, we have a very similar thing, where our only unknown is actually going to be our deflection function y, because ei, well, that's typically given, and the external loads on the system, again, are typically given. So we're actually looking pretty good. We have an equation, and we only really have one unknown. Now, although this is the case, it's still not very clear how we solve for these unknowns. So if we look at the first equation, it's not really clear on how we solve for that displacement vector, and in the second equation, it's not really clear on how we solve for that unknown y. So this is when we get into the fun. And by fun, I mean approximating things. So the first step that we're actually going to need to do is define an approximation function. Now, typically what we do is we select a polynomial. So what I want, if I'm dealing with an Euler Bernoulli beam, I can say that my approximate displacement function is going to be a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared, plus et cetera, et cetera. So I can add as many terms as I want. Now, in general, the more terms that you have, the better the approximation is going to be. Now, if we look at this, we can say, all right, well, x1 is just x1. Therefore, the only unknown I have in my approximation solution are those a coefficients. So that's going to be the whole goal of the Rayleigh-Ritz method is to solve for those a coefficients. Now, because we're dealing with the Rayleigh-Ritz method, as you guys may have guessed, because I said it over and over again, we're going to solve for these A coefficients by minimizing the potential energy. And you're saying, all right, Clayton, this is great. I have an equation for the potential energy. I know what my unknowns are. I'm good to go. Well, we have to slow down a little bit because there's actually one requirement we must fulfill before moving on to minimizing the potential energy, and that is ensuring that our selected approximation function satisfies the essential boundary conditions. Now, if you guys have read textbooks, 
Another word for essential boundary conditions are prescribed boundary conditions. And you're saying, all right, Clayton, well, hold on. What exactly are these essential boundary conditions? Well, these are boundary conditions relating to displacement or rotation. All right, so displacement or rotation. So if I had a cantilever beam here subjected to a load, and I say, all right, well, this isn't too bad. I'm going to select an approximation function a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. I say, all right, well, this is actually an invalid polynomial in the way it currently is because we have a fixed end at the left-hand side. I say, all right, well, if I have a fixed end, well, then the deflection there must be zero. Therefore, my deflection, when my approximation function is equal to zero, must be equal to zero. Therefore, a naught in this particular case has to be equal to zero. And it's the same thing for rotation. If I have a fixed end, we know that the rotation at that point must also be equal to zero. Therefore, my approximation function or the derivative of my approximation function at x1 is equal to zero must be equal to zero. And if I do that, I actually get a1 is equal to zero. Now, this is where I'm going to stress one thing on you guys. Is these have to satisfy essential boundary conditions, which is related to displacement and rotation. Now, if we look at a cantilever here, at x1 is equal to L, or on the right-hand side, we see that we have a free end. Therefore, we know that the moment and the shear at that point is going to be equal to zero. Now, typically, if we were solving an Euler-Bernoulli beam, we can use that as boundary conditions. But in this particular case, we just leave it be because that is actually not an essential boundary condition. All right? So now if we look at our approximation function, and we now know that a0 and a1 have to be equal to 0, while our valid approximation function for this particular case would be a2 times x1 squared. Now you guys may be saying this is actually a lot of work, I have to deal with these essential boundary conditions, but it's actually great, because remember, the whole goal of our approximation function is to solve for those a coefficients. And if we look at our essential boundary conditions, what it did was solve for two of our a coefficients. So the essential boundary conditions actually help us because we can solve for those a coefficients without even getting into the rayleigh ritz method. All right, nice and easy. But if we look at our approximation function, we say, oh, well, we still have a2 as an unknown. How do we solve for that? Well, now we get into that concept of minimizing the potential energy of the system. So to minimize the potential energy of the system, we simply substitute our displacement approximation into our potential energy equation. So let's just say after we satisfy our essential boundary conditions, we have our approximate displacement as a2 multiplied by x1 squared. Now again, keep in mind once we're at this step, we have to have an equation that satisfies those essential boundary conditions. If you don't, things are going to get a little wacky. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our approximation function and simply substitute it into our potential energy equation. Now it's as simple as that. I know that my approximation solution is a2 times x1 squared. So anytime I have y in my potential energy equation, I just substitute it in with one exception, and that is the moment term. So remember that for the moment term, we multiply it by its corresponding rotation, not displacement. How do we get the rotation? Well, we simply just take the derivative of our approximation function. So if our approximation function for displacement was a2 times x1 squared, well, the approximate rotation is simply going to be 2 times a2 times x1. Nice and simple, we just take the derivative. All right, so after we do that, we can minimize the potential energy by taking the derivative of the function with respect to the a coefficients and setting the expression equal to zero. Now, the first part's nice and easy. As you guys know from math, if we want to minimize something, we take the derivative of it and set it equal to zero. Now, this is answering one of the questions we have is how do we minimize that potential energy while well, we're taking the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the a coefficients. So if I were to look at my equation above, my only a coefficient is a2. So what I would do to minimize this potential energy is I'd take the partial derivative of this potential energy with respect to a2, and I set it equal to zero. Now this is great because I now have one equation, and I have one unknown, which is a2. Therefore, I can actually solve for what a2 is. Now you guys may be saying, hold on, Clayton. In your case here, you just picked a nice, easy approximation where our only unknown a coefficient was a2. What happens if at this stage I have a2, a3, a4, a5, etc.? Well, it's simple. We take the partial derivative with respect to each of the a coefficients. So above here, I took the partial derivative with respect to a2, set it equal to 0, I got my equation. 
But if I had a3, well, then I would take the partial derivative with respect to a3, set that equal to 0. I now have a second equation. If I had a4, well, then I take the partial derivative with respect to a4. I have my third equation. So however many unknowns that we have, so if we had, let's say, six unknown a coefficients, well, we actually create six equations. Nice and easy. So we can always solve for those unknown a coefficients. It's nice and easy. Now, at this point, even though I say it's nice and easy, you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, I'm still a little bit confused on the process. So what I did here is I just want to highlight the general steps for the rayleigh ritz approximation method. The first one is we select an approximation function. So again, we typically select a polynomial. So for instance, I can go my approximation function is a0 plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. Now again, you guys can have less terms than this, or you guys can have more terms than this. And the whole goal of the method here is to solve for those unknown a coefficients. So in this particular case, I want to solve for a0, a1, as well as a2. Now before we get into the idea of minimizing the potential energy, we have to make sure that our selected approximation function satisfies all the essential boundary conditions. Now again, those are boundary conditions relating to displacement as well as rotation. So for instance, if I had a pin at x1 is equal to 0, well then I know that the deflection at x1 is equal to 0 must be equal to 0. Therefore, right away I can solve for one of those a coefficients, which is a0. We know that that will be equal to 0. Now, the reason why I selected a pin here is because we also know that the moment at a pin is equal to zero. Therefore, that is technically a boundary condition, but it's not an essential boundary condition. So I just want to remind you guys, essential boundary conditions, displacement, and rotation. So once we satisfy those essential boundary conditions, we can take our approximation function and calculate the internal strain energy of the system. As we saw for Euler Bernoulli beams, we have a nice easy equation where it's the integral over the length of the beam of EI divided by 2 multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function and then squared. Nice and easy because we know all of the terms. Then we move on to the external work done on the system, and that's the same thing. All we're going to do is we're going to take each of the externally applied forces and multiply it by its corresponding displacement. Now, again, I already emphasized this, but I want to do it again because it's such a common mistake is when we're dealing with concentrated loads or concentrated moments, we multiply it by the displacement or the rotation specifically at the point of that load. From there, it gets actually nice and easy. We calculate the potential energy of the system, and we know that that is simply the internal strain energy, which we calculated in step three, minus the work done on the system, which we calculated in step four. So at this point, we actually have no real unknowns. Now we get into the fun stuff, and that is minimizing the potential energy by taking the partial derivative of the potential energy with respect to each of the unknown a coefficients and setting that equal to zero. So at this point, let's say that I had a1 and a2 still as unknown coefficients. Well, I take the partial derivative of my potential energy with respect to a1, set that equal to zero. Then I take the partial derivative of my potential energy with respect to a2, and I set that equal to zero. And from here, it's pretty obvious what we do next. We solve for the system of equations obtained in step six, for those unknown a coefficients. So remember from step six, I basically created two equations and I know that I have two unknowns, therefore I can solve for a1 and a2. Now, if you guys are still having a little bit of questions concerning this process, I find the best way to figure it out is by looking at examples. Now, if you guys look in the description below, as you guys will see, I have a link to a number of examples dealing with the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Now, if we look at the later half here, we only focused on how to apply the Rayleigh-Ritz method for beams, but of course we said we can apply it to continuum. So in my examples down below, I do solve an example in which we use the Rayleigh-Ritz method for a continuum, but I also have a number of examples on how to apply the Rayleigh-Ritz method for Euler-Bernoulli beams. I solve one using computer software because that allows us to add a lot of terms, and then I solve one by hand just to really emphasize how the method is conducted. And that's it for this video. So thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.